He's uh, watching the screen right now. He, yeah, this is the one here. Is it, is it live right now? It should be. Yeah. Check, 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 check. We're going to start in a few minutes um, just to, for the food. We got 15 minutes on the food, y'all. So you want to get food? It's about to be taken 15 minutes. So go ahead and knock it out. It's, it's not, it wasn't cheap. But it's a free symposium, though. 
Food is free, y'all. So get that free food. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to start in a few minutes. Waiting on the uh, more folks to come in. Is the faith breath is over, faith folks? Y'all here? Yeah, so we're waiting, we have a faith breath, so waiting for the faith folks to get over.
So yeah, that's the second one. Do you want me to do the other one first? Do the other one first, Chris. So you can hover over this, and then she's like, like that. Did that first? Did it update? I'm sorry. This is the first one. Sorry. So you can hover over it, and then go left to right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. Is that the right one? Yep. Oh, yeah. the, the, this was second. The other one's first. This one. The other one. Sorry, I got confused. Oh, yeah. Um, and then you think you should be able to get that. You got to go. You got to go. Yeah, I see. It's a, it's a build up. It's a build up. Okay. Oh, you're fine. So good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Good morning. Y'all give me that good morning back. A call of response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Shakobi Wilson. Um, I am the one of the MCs for this show today. Uh, really excited to have y'all here at the ninth uh, CGMD Environmental Justice and Health Disparities Symposium. Uh, of course, this is day three of the symposium. Uh, the theme this year is people, power, and politics. And let me say it a little bit more energy because I'm trying to wake up. People, power, and politics, okay? So hopefully y'all have uh, enjoyed the first two days of the symposium and uh, live stream folks, we're, we're starting now. I know y'all appreciate y'all being on, uh, on the stream. Uh, day one started out with a, a keynote from Reverend Barbara to get us started talking about issues of uh, intersection of, of race and poverty and how we didn't look at uh, inequality, right? And there's, he said, there's no divide between us, right? We need to bridge those, those, uh, those divides and we need to work together. We had a lot of great concurrent sessions uh, on day one as well. Uh, a really interesting uh, conversation, Mustafa Ali, about uh, reparations, if not when, uh, if, when we're gonna have those reparations, uh, restorative justice. We had other sessions during the, during the afternoon, uh, many sessions on um, energy issues, uh, indigenous issues, um, also issues around just in communities that are impacted by, by, by uh, environmental justice. We also had a, a really interesting closing session uh, with the NWCP. And again, because of the theme, people, power, and politics, that was very appropriate to have them have a session because the NWCP has been really important part of our infrastructure uh, to really address issues of racial justice, social justice, right, economic justice. We talk about the octopus of oppression, right? So we're going to work on these issues. We have to work together. And I think I got a little too, bit too excited for those of you who saw me at the end of that session. So I'm going to try to woosah today and not get too revved up, too amped up, right? And then on day two, again, our uh, uh, second virtual uh, uh, day, uh, we started out, again, with, with a really interesting, uh, you know, presentation from Robin Morris Collin, um, uh, senior advisor to the, uh, on the environmental justice to the EPA administrator. She told some really interesting stories, right? And she said, we don't have a capacity issue. We have an access issue. I know we have both, but I do appreciate the, you know, the sentiment that we need to, a lot of group, groups that have, they have the tools, they have the knowledge, they have the skills, right? Uh, they need more access to the dollars. They, they need more access to the BIL money, they need more access to Inflation Reduction Act money. They need more access to the dollars to make change happen because you have systems in place that are stopping folks from accessing those dollars. And then we had other, again, really interesting um, uh, plenary uh, concurrent sessions. Uh, we had discussions. Uh, the closing session on day two was, um, and I like saying this, this EJ Goldberg in the hills. How many of y'all participated in that session? Y'all were attending EJ Goldman of Hills. Hopefully y'all got the point of all these, e we got all this money, y'all, right? And it should be for frontline, fenceline communities who are authentically fighting for environmental energy, climate, justice, right? Water justice, right? 
but we have a lot of people who are speculating who are coming into this space who don't come from the community and who may extract from the community. So it could be a form of racial extractive capitalism. It could be a form of, you know, more colonizing, right? It could be a form of pain pimping. If we're gonna do this right, we have to make sure the money gets to the people with the most need. If you're at the front line, if you're a front line community, you should be at the front of the line and getting the dollars. I'm gonna say it again. If you are front line, you should be at the front of the line and getting the dollars. That's what that session's about. We may be in a boom that could be a bust, but if you weren't there before the money, why are you here now for when, when there is money? Are you gonna be here when we don't have money? That means you're not authentically engaged in the movement. We need to make sure people who are on the ground are authentically engaged. You can be an ally, be there when there's no money. You can be an ally, be there with no resources. And I skipped Justin Pearson. Justin Pearson said, Representative Pearson said, you gotta be all in. Y'all already said, if you're gonna be in this space, you gotta be all in. If you ain't all in, we don't need you. I hate to say it that way. This can't be performative. EJ don't stop at nine, uh, five o'clock, y'all. EJ don't stop on Saturday on the weekends. Folks are suffering, living in, being in sacrifice zones, dealing with toxic trauma. We need to be there all the time to, as allies support them. Justin Pearson said, you gotta be all in. You hear, you saw his fight about um, gun violence in Tennessee and what he's done as one of the Tennessee three. We have to model that. We have to replicate that. We have to scale that. So again, I'm getting a little excited. Let me, let me woo saw. Now, today's agenda is our in-person agenda. And we're, we had a fake breakfast, uh, it may be still ongoing. Hopefully folks are able to come over uh, from that session. We're gonna have a lot of sessions uh, over the next three, three days that are more about what's happening in our region, the mid-Atlantic region. Today's sessions, we're gonna have a lot of sessions with government officials uh, giving updates on what they're doing uh, within the region, legislative sessions. We're gonna have a lot of sessions about community engagement and what folks are doing as it relates to air pollution. Uh, we'll have sessions around food sovereignty. And we're gonna have sessions uh, really about climate justice as well. So really excited about today's uh, agenda. Our closing session is gonna be on the Tic Tacs, in which I'll, I'll talk about the Tic Tacs more in the, in the next couple of slides. And then we'll have a closing reception and documentary viewing uh, on, the, on the call, The Smell of Money. The Smell of Money is a documentary um, that focuses on industrial hog farming uh, in, in North Carolina. Some of you are very familiar with industrial chicken farming in the Eastern Shore, in, um, in Delaware, on the Delmarva uh, Peninsula. Similar issues. That's going to be our kind of our closing reception, closing uh, documentary viewing. But I, I really want us to think of today about what it means when it comes to people, power, and politics. Before I move on to our our opening session, our opening plenary session, I just want to make sure you know uh, give shout outs to our sponsors. So we got Meta Money. Uh, Bezos, I know how y'all feel about Bezos and that Amazon stuff. We gotta, you know, work that out. Uh, we have a partnership with the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, Wildlife Federation is the parent on the TikTok, and you know, I'll talk about that. The Environmental Defense Fund, the Yellowship Foundation, which is now uh, the uh, Skyline Foundation. Uh, one of our core partners uh, in the region is Namate. Of course, US EPA, uh, other parts, Union, Union Concerned Scientists. Then we have School of Public Health, others. And I want to make sure that um, we have faith partners who have organized sessions, including this, the Faith Breakfast, uh, Interfaith Power and Light. And I also want to uh, acknowledge um, our community partners. I want to acknowledge the team who helped organize this symposium. Um, our symposium is uh, members of SIEGE, Center for Communication, Environmental Health, so the staff. So uh, Shanice, uh, Pamela, Ariel, uh, also uh, Paul, in, in Holly, Bacola, Eli, uh, we have some of our new staff that come on board, uh, uh, Dr. White, Marlena, uh, Melissa, and all the, all the volunteers, all the volunteer moderators, uh, volunteer students. So thank you for your support. Now what I want to do is switch out and talk about, move to our first session. So... Just to give you a little bit of background, this session is on uh, kind of a soft launch
for our um, region three, for the region three Tic Tac. And, it, and that TCTAC stands for Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Center. And so I'm the co-director of the uh, region three Tic Tac with Dr. Adrian Hollis. And so, yeah, yeah it's good. Give, give folks a hand. So these Tic Tacs are part of the infrastructure uh, that, you know, the federal government is trying to put in place to provide support to communities who are impacted by environmental, uh, climate, and energy uh, injustices. And so just a little bit of background. On well, April 13, 2023, the EPA um, announced the Tic Tacs. They selected 16 of these uh, technical assistance centers. And gave out about $177 million, or so we'll be getting $177 million uh, to these technical assistance centers. So we have about, we have 13 uh, regional Tic Tacs. You know that the EPA has 10 regions. Uh, so there's, there's 13 regional Tic Tacs. Part of the reason we have 13, uh, the Gulf Coast has, um, Region 6 has a Tic Tac that covers both Region 6 and parts of Region 4. That's Dr. Beverly Wright's Tic Tac of Deep South Center. And so it's additional Tic Tac in Region 6. And also Chicago Blacks and Green, that's a Chicago area-wide Tic Tac. And then in Region 5, that's more of a region-wide uh, Tic Tac that's out of the University of Minnesota. And so our Tic Tac uh, covers uh, the states of Maryland, D.C., Virginia, Delaware, uh, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Jerome, I almost forgot Pennsylvania. Sorry about that. And most of the Tic Tacs received $10 million dollars. Uh, we received 12 million. Part of the reason why we received 12 million because they wanted to uh, have an expansion of the uh, our, our expand our ability and our capacity to engage communities in rural areas. In in um, Region Three, we have a lot of rural, rural areas in uh, Appalachia, and that's part of the driver behind why we got additional dollars to make sure we have appropriate coverage of those hard to reach, uh, uh, resource constrained, low capacity rural uh, groups that work in, in rural communities that are impacted by uh, environmental and energy and climate justice issues. So the purpose of these Tic Tacs really to help with training and technical assistance. So a lot of what we're, what we're gonna be doing is, is providing training and technical assistance to help people um, write grant proposals so they can, so they can apply for federal funding. Uh, again, monies that are coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, monies that are part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, monies that may be part of other uh, federal um, funding streams through various federal agencies. So this funding is a collaborative uh, funding opportunity between the EPA and Department of Energy. But we'll be uh, helping to train uh, members of organizations to apply for funding from various uh, federal sources and also non-federal sources. Also, a Tic Tac can help with community engagement uh, facilitation and in, 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 uh, outreach to some of the hard to reach uh, resource constrained communities. Also communities that may be linguistically isolated. Um, it, it also builds off some of the technical assistance work that's happening through the Department of Transportation. In, in addition, uh, the Tic Tac is this, this Tic Tac initiative, you know, providing technical assistance and supports the capacity building is part of the federal government's larger Justice 40 initiative. So, you know, Justice 40 is related to uh, Executive Order 14008. That's sort of that uh, one of the executive orders on climate change. And so as we move from a, a dirty energy, a fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy, 40% of the benefits of federal investments should go to disadvantaged communities. So these, these tic tacs or technical assistance centers are gonna be part of the, the, the hubs in each region, region to provide support to communities who are experiencing these issues, who need support again, particularly in the grant writing space, to be able to, be able to develop uh, proposals in response to RPs that are out there. So in our Tic Tac, we have multiple partners. What I wanna do now, uh, I want the partners um, on the Tic Tac to stand up. So the parent partner is the National Wildlife Federation. I believe Dr. Agent Hollis should be in room. Please stand up. Applause. 
So Dr. Hollis is the co-director of Tic Tac. Uh, of course, we have uh, my team, Siege, at the University of Maryland. We also have the Environmental Finance Center. Is anybody from the Environmental Finance Center? You want to stand up, Adissa? So I originally had a plan, everybody, to let y'all know to have everybody up on the stage. We only have three chairs. So I had to adjust that on the fly. You see how I do this? Adjust it. Because <laughs> we don't have enough chairs. So, so we had to have a different approach. But so we have that. And then our community partners, uh, we have uh, Central Del Polio Familiar. Uh, they're one of community uh, uh, hub partners. We also have folks from South Baltimore Community Land Trust. As I go, if y'all here, can y'all stand up? South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Uh, we also have, hey. Uh, we have uh, another hub partner uh, for this for this project. Um, we have uh, Sentinels of Eastern Shore Health Sesh. And we have a Sussex, Sussex Environmental Health Network. So Sess and Shin is a mom and son uh, team up. Uh, uh, Maria Payne and Mike Payne, again, dealing with a lot of the issues associated with industrial chicken farming. Uh, and again, as I said earlier, in the Eastern Shore uh, of Maryland, also in Southern Delaware. In addition, am I forgetting any partners? Hold on. So we, we have Jerome Shabazz, uh, again, there I go, Jerome, for getting Pennsylvania, and uh, Philadelphia with the Overbrook Center. <laughs> Sorry about that, Jerome. And then we have uh, our DC hub is uh, Empower DC. Anybody representing Empower DC, can you stand up, please? Woo, Empower DC. So Parisa Naruzi um, uh, is, is the lead for that organization. And so we, we also have two, so we have community partners, and we also have two uh, HBCU partners, and we have Morgan State. Uh, the lead is uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Barnes. Uh, Dr. Barnes, can you stand up? And we have West Virginia State. Is Adam here? Hey, Adam. West Virginia State. So um, Morgan State is going to be our lead uh, HBCU hub, so helping to organize HBCUs in the Mid-Atlantic region. So you think about HBCUs in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, where we have Jerome Cheney and Lincoln, Cheney and Lincoln, Delaware State, uh, HBCUs in the state of Maryland, so Morgan State, uh, Bowie State, uh, Coppin State, Eastern Shore. Am I forgetting anybody? I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. Then we have DC area uh, HBCUs, and also maybe primary black institutions too, uh, Dr. Barnes. So Howard, uh, UDC, and also Trinity. I want to get Trinity in because that's a, a primarily black women's college in, in DC. And then we also have all the Virginia schools uh, the, to, to not, not, not and, we also have West Virginia uh, schools as well. But uh, in Virginia, we have Virginia State, uh, Virginia Union, uh, Hampton, and I'm maybe forgetting a couple others that are in Virginia. And of course we have Adam, was it four, four HBCUs in West Virginia? There's two, there's two, there's two HBCUs in West Virginia. Okay, so the two HBCUs in West Virginia. So, and then West Virginia State will be both a, it's gonna be a hybrid hub. It's, it'll be a, the main HBCU partner in West Virginia, but also doing more of that community outreach engagement because of their extension, because the extension uh, service component. So, so those, so what we have is, so we have um, a um, spoken hub approach so all the community partners are hubs, right? So what we're doing is those hubs will get uh, training and capacity building support uh, funding to build, build up their infrastructure, okay? And then they will go out into that geographic area coverage to, to, to help with technical assistance and capacity building if, uh, with organizations that, they, uh, that we intake, right? And that we recruit and who needs support. Now the core partners, institutional partners, uh, National Wildlife Federation, uh, Siege and Environmental Finance Center would also be providing a lot of that core technical assistance and capacity building support. So for example, uh, the National Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Federation is dependent on it. So a lot of the kind of fiscal infrastructure and management is gonna come from the National Wildlife Federation. The project management will come from the National Wildlife Federation. When it comes to Siege's work, we'll be providing a lot of support uh, we'll be providing a lot of support as relates to uh, some of the um, environmental assessment 
as it relates to what the Environmental Finance Center would be doing, they'll be providing a lot of support on the grant writing side. Um, so I just wanted to share that. So what are our objectives? Here's some of our objectives. This is objective one, again, to the outreach and engagement. So SIEGE will be leading a lot of that work. When it comes to objective two, uh, we have delivered technical assistance. So part of it is um, community science training. You know, SIEGE, we do a lot of air quality monitoring. So if, there, if there's uh, community groups that want to assist us with that, we can help with that. Also, we'll be helping out with a lot of GIS mappings as geographic information systems. So we develop a number of tools uh, just to uh, give us some uh, uh, audience participation. How many of you have heard of US EPA EJ screen? Oh, yeah, y'all y'all are good. OK, cool. How many of you have heard of this uh, CQ CGIST tool? Raise your hand. Not as many. So that's the uh, CGIST is the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. And in the state of Maryland, we've also built tools. Maryland EJ Screen, we built a tool called a Park Equity Mapping Tool. That's a Department of Natural Resources tool. We helped to update that tool. We also have a Climate Equity Health Mapping Tool that we helped to build. And an exciting development, uh, we have a GIS team, again, Holly McCullough and Eli. We built a Mid-Atlantic EJ Screening Tool. So for all the Mid-Atlantic states, we have a tool now that everybody can use. So you can look within your own state uh, and hopefully be able to compare to what's happening. So within your state, at the track level and the block group level, right, Holly or Bacola? Y'all in here? Okay. The units of analysis, track level and block group level, and also compare what's happening in other mid-Atlantic states. Okay. And, and in objective three, again, this is to go back to that. We have uh, environmental finance centers that's leading that part of the work on the grant writing side. We also have secondary partners, uh, uh, collaborative partners, who I want to just uh, shout out real quick. Uh, EPN, the Environmental Professionals Network, those are retired EPA uh, folks. They'll be assisting with our project, and they're already doing their, a lot of their own grant writing, uh, um, inf building their own grant writing infrastructure, so we'll be able to leverage that. Also, Dr. Margo Brown, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, FREE. What does FREE stand for again, y'all? Thank you. Frontline Resources Institute. We have a session um, Saturday, Saturday, right? And so the Frontline Resources Institute, they're doing a lot of um, uh, grant writing uh, support as well. They also have writing for green. So we'll be engaging EPN, the Frontline Resources Institute, and writing for green to help us with the grant writing support. Let me say this, y'all. I know I'm doing a lot of talking. And, and I always know, I always say, I'm a talker. I'm talking way too much. I say it every time. That's, not, that's one of my things I do. We had a Tic Tac meet at the White House yesterday, and they gave presentations on all the federal funding that's coming out. I was overwhelmed, y'all. If I'm overwhelmed, what? how are communities feeling who don't have enough staff, right, who have volunteers, who don't have good Wi-Fi access, who can't just pull together a grant proposal? So that's one of the comments I made. Like, there's a lot of money out there, right? But the infrastructure capacity, people don't have grant writers on their teams. And even what we're trying to do uh, is going to be great, but I think it's not going to be enough. So we need more partners, right? We need as many partners as possible to be actively in working with us as it relates to uh, how we provide grant writing support to EPA, to support EPA submissions, EPA proposal submissions, also DOE and other federal agencies, and also our uh, non-federal submissions, of course, to uh, philanthropic sources, right, to foundations. And so that's a big objective. That's, to me, this in many ways is, is, is probably the heart of the tick. This is the, one of the, the primary objectives of these tic tacs is to help with grant writing support, capacity building for grant writing. And objective four is really about helping the communities concern that, that go through our intake process to better engage with local government, state government, business and industry. Think about y'all through the bipartisan infrastructure law, Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of that money is gonna be going to businesses, it's gonna be doing, putting in the infrastructure. So making sure those infrastructure um, needs, their response to the needs of the community, they're engaging with these communities that are looking for new energy, uh, clean energy infrastructure. So our National Wildlife Federation team will be taking a lead on that. They, they have an energy justice team, so they'll be taking a lead on that. But we also have other partners that we could potentially engage uh, in our region, like the Energy Foundation is doing a lot of work in the space. 
Uh, we also have other groups. Uh, we like that some companies we like to engage, like uh, they provide less support. Uh, we like to engage as well in that part of the work. And there's some new projects around energy resilience. Uh, even the Green Line Institute, I think, has some work that may be something we can leverage. And, of course, um, the MCEC is doing a lot of work in this space as well. And we had a recent meeting with them. And we want to engage other groups like MCEC, Maryland. Well, thank you. Maryland Clean Energy Center. Uh, engage other clean energy centers uh, that may be in our other uh, sister states uh, in, uh, in D.C., Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. So those are our four objectives uh, of the Tic Tac. And again, this is, this, is, um, this is sort of our soft launch, and we're using the symposium as a soft launch for the Tic Tac. So we'll have other sessions during the symposium uh, related to the Tic Tac, including a session at 1110, uh, which will be a meet and greet between the Tic Tac and Match. Just real quickly, MATCH is the Mid-Atlantic Climate Action Hub. Uh, that is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So it, is, it in itself is a mini Tic Tac. It also has a pass-through pass -through component. So we have to, we have the, some of the same hub partners are hubs for the, that are for the Tic Tac, also hubs for MATCH. The difference is we have two additional groups that are hubs for MATCH. Uh, so, uh, Soft Ward, Environmental Alliance, would I say the right, uh, Kim? Um, SWEA. Uh, Newark, New Jersey, and also you, Paul, uh, uh, Queen Shabazz's group down in, in Virginia. So that's, those are two additional uh, groups that are that are hubs as part of Match. Uh, when you look at our current activities, again, we have we'll have a series of workshops. Uh, we'll have workshops at this symposium. We'll have three grant writing workshops, a grant writing series. So if you're going to attend those, please attend all three. That's been co-led by the EFC, uh, Medissa who's here, and also with Paul from my team. We'll also have, um, we'll have workshops on GIS mapping. Uh, again, Maryland EJ screen, our climate equity mapping tool. Then we also have a, a US EPA EJ screen and maybe some other tools as well. And we'll have uh, some workshops on air quality sensors. And then we'll have a lot of sessions uh, from our Tic Tac Hub partners uh, related to their work on environmental justice. So. We'll have uh, SWIL have their session on what's happening in New Jersey. So our Baltimore Community Land Trust is going to have a session on uh, what's happening in Baltimore. We're going to have um, Jerome is going to be on multiple sessions uh, today, including our lunchtime plenary session. We talk about uh, 30 years of NEJAC, and we'll, I'll get into that later during that lunchtime. We'll also have a participation. I think um, Maria and Mike, you've already had a session earlier. Not, your session hasn't happened yet. It happens on Friday. So I talk about the issues in the east, eastern shore of Southern Delaware around uh, biogas and industrial chicken farms. Uh, Central Delaware Point Familiar is going to have a session around EJ issues that impact on Latinx populations. So all of our partners are very engaged. Uh, we'll have sessions related to that work uh, during, this, during this symposium. We, we have some other bullets here. I don't want to spend too much time on those. But you can see we're, the Federation is going through a lot of work to just we're doing a lot of ramping up, y'all. To do this right, we have to ramp up our teams. So we're hiring new staff. We're going through our work plan process to make sure each partner has their work plan. We're trying to make sure we have every, all the budgets in place. We also uh, are building out an intake process. Uh, we have a new, a new website. I'll show when I move forward in the slides, you'll see the website, the working website that National Wildlife Federation is hosting for the, for the Tic Tac. We also have a, a number uh, if you want to do intake now, if you want to uh, call in and say you need support, you need services, Dr. Hollis, should I announce the number now or should we wait? So what's the what's the number, Dr. Hollis? Two. So the number is two zero two seven nine two five three five zero. And we also have a 1-800 number, 1-800-757-1405. Now, I know I should have had this on the slides, but, uh, but we have those two numbers. So what we're trying to do as part of the intake process, we want folks to call those numbers, right? And if you need support or you can be a partner, okay? One of the things in our proposal that we, want, we, we, we talk about is the EPA's collaborative problem-solving model. Many of y'all may not know what that is. I don't want to get too wonky on y'all, but the whole idea is 
How can we build partnerships and how can we leverage resources? If you are already doing work in this space in our region, you can partner with us. If you're already working on energy justice, we want you to work with us. If you're already doing grant writing, uh, we want you to work with us, right? If you if you are already doing outreach in rural communities, we want you to work with us, all right? So that's part of the leveraging. That's part of the leveraging we're trying to do. So we want to make sure that we have a matrix of those uh, partners who are already doing work that can support this Tic Tac. So the idea is as we move forward out of this ramp up phase into phase two, more of the rollout phase, we will have potentially have work groups for each objective. We will have core partners, hub partners, and secondary partners who will be a work group for objective one, a work group for objective two, a work group for objective three, and a work group for objective four. So that's one of the ways that as we roll this out, we'll work together to make sure that we are, uh, you know, have a plan, we implement the plan, and we, we start providing services uh, to those uh, community groups uh, of need uh, throughout the region. And also, that when I want to make sure Dr. Barnes said, what about HBCUs? And Adam is saying, what about HBCUs? We'll also have that as well in, in this process because we want to make sure we're engaging HBCU faculty, HBCU students in the communities that HBCUs are hosted in in this process as well. So here's some uh, information about projected outcomes for, for this Tic Tac. I'm going to, you know, y'all can read that. And then next steps. So I said earlier, our Tic Tac, unlike many other Tic Tacs, uh, we, we didn't just receive 10 million, we received 12 million. We received the extra $2 million so we could expand our hubs. So one of the hubs that we've already selected uh, was Empower DC. They weren't one of our original hubs. Uh, so Empower DC is one of our new hubs. We're looking to bring in three additional hubs. So a Virginia hub, and I put a question mark, a Appalachian focused hub, which of course covers multiple states, right? So that could be also part of Virginia, uh, part of Maryland, uh, also uh, part of Pennsylvania, right? And, and then uh, West Virginia. And then a, 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 a potentially a Pittsburgh hub. And if I was at home, uh, doing this from Zoom, which I will be tomorrow. Y'all will see my Steelers, because, uh, no, I'm just joking. I am a Steelers fan. I am a Steelers fan, but it's not because I'm a Steelers fan. Wink, wink. Uh, but trying to have a Pittsburgh hub, because we want Pennsylvania is a large state, so we have a Jerome's group as the Philadelphia hub. We want to have another hub on the other side of the state. Uh, so we want to make sure we're covering that part of the Mid-Atlantic region better. And so those hubs are going to be more probably, two of those hubs are going to be more uh, focused on that part of Mid-Atlantic, and then we need to have a Virginia a Virginia hub too. Uh, so we're in the process of, of reviewing and vetting organizations that could be uh, those three hubs. Uh, develop a communications uh, strategy, uh, you know, developing more of our workshop infrastructure. And again, we're doing a, uh, some mini workshops at this, at this symposium. Also, uh, as I already mentioned, the website, we have a you know, basic website now, it'll be updated, upgraded uh, as we go along. And then, um, Again, this inclusive development and implementation of inclusive technical assistance strategy. So our more official Tic Tac launch will be September 26th. And it will, it will be at the Trinity, um, Trinity, Trinity Baptist Church in um, Ivy City in Washington, D.C. So those of you who are from the region, y'all know Ivy City, the Cromwell School, the fight uh, to, to preserve the criminal school and, and make that a cultural community asset. And the fact that community is, is dealing with an onslaught of uh, a local pollution source. What's that facility called? The, the, the chemical plant? Those of you DC? Is it TE? Forget the name of the facility. We have a, they have a facility that's been polluting for over 100 years that doesn't have an air quality permit right in the community. And of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, 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 vehicle traffic. Uh, so a lot of combustion byproducts from the vehicle traffic. So we'll be there um, uh, next in a couple of weeks as part of the official launch. And then if you want to go to the website uh, for the Tic Tac, here's, here's the website link. So that's, those, that's, that's enough of me talking. I want to uh, spend some time taking questions. In the, the so are there any questions from the audience? Uh, we have about 12 minutes before we transition. I uh, want you to start transitioning to the first block of sessions. But any questions from the audience about the Tic Tac? So, which, wh wh who's saying what up first? Did your hand go first? Okay. Do we have a, we have any mics? Um, where is the, where's the, oh. So here's a mic right here. You can, you can come right here or. 
Yeah, you, yeah, you can come right here. And you also, if you want to go. Is, what's your name? Testing, testing. And what organization you're with? Go ahead. Uh, Chad Martin, NC Black Alliance. Um, let me first start off by saying thank you for the amazing work you and all the team did for yes, putting this whole week together. Um, thank you, sir. I say that to say my frustration is not for you. Oh, I got you. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay. So that's why I wanted to preface. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, um, that's go ahead. You're good. But it sounded like you had the ear of the White House. And so my frustration with the mm. T-Tax Center is, so number one, you said your area gets 12 million. Mm -hmm. I'm from North Carolina. We're region four. Oh, yeah. I know about your region. Y'all, they didn't even engage with community groups. And should I say that? It's been extreme. They was, didn't engage with community groups and actually developing that grant proposal. So I know about it. Well, they pulled back right now. But my, my issue is, so we just talked to a group in Greensboro. Mm -hmm. The park, one park in Greensboro was built. The park was built on the landfill. Yes, sir. They're talking about it's 39 million to cover that. That's one park in North Carolina. Come to find out there's 300 parks in North Carolina that were built on landfills. Yep. So that's one of my frustrations. If you guys are only getting 12 million, I'm assuming North Carolina is probably getting about the same. They get, they're, gonna probably, they're, gonna get 10, they're getting 10 million for this Tic Tac. So how is that going to cover that? Yeah. My, number two, I'm trying to get all the information out to as many local governments, nonprofits. By the time I got the information out to them about the accelerator program, mm -hmm. the application is already closed. Yeah. Until next year. Um, my next issue is capacity. So I used to serve on city council in Virginia. When I told my um, area about the IRA grant, mm -hmm. uh, the solar for all, by the time it's time to get the application in, they don't have time to pull staff together. And these are the very areas when you talk about cumulative impact yes sir mapping tool when yep. you talk about all those ej screen i was with deq so i used to teach the ej screen yep. in virginia um i know queen shabazz um all those screening tools all these areas that fit in line with these mapping tools somehow i, I got excited about the t-tax center but then when i started pulling back and thinking like number one you're not giving areas enough time to get the information in yeah. i got happy about the money but really that money is not enough to It's a really... drop in a bucket, yes. So my... let me let me respond. Let me respond. Yeah. So please, if you can, tell the White House. Yeah. So um, for for you in North Carolina, you should be working with North Carolina EJ Network. I, I I was raised up in the EJ movement with them, right? So working with them locally near you, uh, Omega Wilson with Mebbin, West End, West End Revitalization. That's my that's my mentor. That's what my other PhD with Omega. Okay. Actually, I have more papers published with, with Omega than I do with my actual PhD, which is on industrial hog farms, because I, I did my work with Dr. Wing on hog farms. So North Carolina is where I grew up in the EJ movement. Right. So those uh, NC EJ Network and Omega is a place to start. Now, your Tic Tac should be com 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 communicating with them about how they're going to be engaging with y'all to access resources, to address the brownfields issue. So Jerome Shabazz in Philadelphia does a lot of work on brownfields revitalization. We are going to be hopefully working with our Brownfields Technical Assistance uh, uh, Group that's at West Virginia, West Virginia, right, Adam, at West Virginia. So you have that. So you, so you have the Brownfields program. Through should be engaged. Brownsville through DEQ? Uh, yeah, through, through, through DEQ. Okay. So, but we got to figure out who's, your, who's the Region 4 Technical Assistance Center for Brownfields in Region 4 to engage with them. And also, who is your Superfund Center? That's another group to be engaging with Superfund Centers and then working with DEQ and also OLM, the, the acronym is OLM, y'all, Office of Land, <laughs> what's, the, what's Environment Management, I think, I'm, I'm not I'm messing up y'all, but EPA OLM, O-L-E-M. So working with OLM and also working with DEQ in, on that, on those issues and working through your Brownfields Technical Assistance Center for Region 4 to help bring folks together and working with your mako like group in the state of North Carolina, your, your county organizations and your mayor organizations to say who's engaging to get the dollars as it relates to addressing the land, landfill cleanup and any revolving issues with landfills. Now, so that's the, that's the first part. You talked about the capacity issue. One of the things that we're trying to do with our Environmental Finance Center, and I made a comment about the Tic Tacs, all the grants that are coming out. We have to make sure, we talked about having a grant inventory and grant calendar. And, and, and just making sure we have that information because 
as I said, I was overwhelmed by all the things that they listed yesterday. Right. So if I'm overwhelmed, community groups who may not have as much staff as I have, they're going to be overwhelmed, uh, you know, doubly, triply, you know, maybe a thousand percent, right? So that's something we have to we have to do. And what's your other your other question? Um, so money, um, capacity to even write the grants, and then, you know, extending the grant timeline because when people are just now getting this information, just finding out, by the time they find out, I, I think I think one thing to do is to engage with NEJAC, the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, to, to the next time we have public comments to make public comments, make public comments to WEJAC, the Wildlife Environmental Justice Advisory Council, about these issues, and then also send comments directly to the, the managers of those programs. I, I've expressed some concerns about the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, right. the, 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 letter, the letter of intent process for the Soul for All program. That was so quick. And I think that's actually, when I made the point about access earlier, right? That's not creating access, that's leading to differential access. Unless you ever have the machinery in place, it's gonna be biased to certain organizations. Right. So let me let me stop there, because I know we got probably other questions, but thank you for thank that. You. Thank yes, sir. I want, I'm gonna give a dissertation that said y'all talk a lot, <laughs> every, every question, but thanks for those questions. Okay. Hi, my name is Louise Leaf. I'm with the Science and the Media Project. On Tuesday, there was a panel, it was panel 3B on environmental justice barriers. Two of the panelists said they are being required to uh, partner with industry in order to apply for funds. And in many cases, industry is the problem in their neighborhoods and is polluting. So could you elaborate on how it is that uh, these community groups are being uh, required to partner with an industry partner in order to apply for funds and where that is applicable and how that works? Yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure which particular grant programs that that's the case. It may be a requirement that they have to have a business partner. For example, the collaborative problem solving model grant, right? For example, used to require that you had a business partner. But I think if you have, is it, just to, if you can go back to the mic, are they required to partner with a specific polluting industry, but other industries the community who may be more on the clean energy, more on the solution side? Uh, well, the, the two panelists who mentioned this, one was Sharon Levine at uh, Rye St. James, and the other was Maria Lopez Nunez of the Ironbound community. And both of them mentioned this as a major barrier and a major problem to applying for EJ funds. Yeah, it's, it's really, thank you for that clarification. So it's really interesting. So y'all know uh, Rye St. James dealing with, you know, uh, uh, the petrochemical industry, and then Maria's group dealing with an Ironbound community in Newark, dealing with it was an incinerator issue, a um, lot of traffic issues, a lot of major polluters, right? And dust polluters in the area. So I think that creates a barrier because there's a trust issue there. And, the, and these industries have a, have a track record of being uh, poisoning people. Why would you want to partner with people, the organizations that have been poisoning uh, your community? So I think going back to the comment, the question before, right? That's a barrier. And there needs to be more, I think, thinking that goes into these uh, RFPs, this, you know, to exclude uh, those type of organizations that have been part of the problem from, from being able to access these dollars. So we should be all writing letters to our representatives in the implementation of the IRA, the BIL, and Justice 40. How are you going to, I mean, it's part of the Justice 40 implementation. That makes no sense, just to be clear, that you're requiring community groups to partner with polluters. You're requiring community groups to partner with the people who poison them. You're, you know, that's not getting to justice. So I, I would advocate for everybody in this room to pressure local you know, uh, representatives, state representatives, uh, and, and you know, US uh, House or Senate representatives, uh, officials about that issue because that, that creates, I think, as was stated before, another barrier um, so that's, that's my response to that question. It, but thanks, thanks for the question. Any other questions before we transition? Uh, oh, uh, come, oh, Agent, let's go, go first, and then I'll come to you. Well, mine is more, um, since we're all in the room, I, one of the things we learned yesterday was about the, the fact that e 
the agencies want these funding opportunities to sort of be connected, like stepwise and whatever. And I know that, you know, we were all working on our grant proposals. I think we were doing um, grant makers and um, Dr. Wilson and others took time out to write a grant for the forestry program. And I don't even know if you know this, but that was just funded for $20 million. And so maybe to congratulate him and um, the huh? team. What? With uh, Chesapeake Bay Trust. That got Casey. funded? Yeah. I got it right here. <laughs> I got For how much? $20 million. Well, look at that. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, oh, that's like Christmas early. Okay. But it's for the community. It's not for me. You know, I'm just a facilitator. I'm a convener and networker. I, my dad's like, you getting that money? I'm like, nah, they don't get none of that money, man. You know how family, you, you know, I don't get, I don't get a pay raise. I'm not, I, it's, I'm not on commission. <laughs> There's no commission, sir. No, just to, thank you for that. Just to add to that, and I'm coming to you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring down my giddiness. What we're trying to do, and i just extend the, thank you for that, uh, make, making that announcement, Adrian, uh, Dr. Hollis, just to extend that point. What we're trying to do with the TIC-TAC, again, it's the heart of our capacity building and um, uh, technical assistance support, right? But we also have applied for multiple grants to build a Mid-Atlantic Environmental Justice Fund. I didn't say that. So we submitted a grant to the $50 million grant to the EPA. We will know about that in November. We found out yesterday in November. Uh, we submitted a $50 million grant to, for urban forestry, uh, forestry program to USDA. And we just, as an agent announced, we got 20 million. We also are working on applying to the uh, Coastal Community Challenge for NOAA, 50 to 75 million. We submitted a letter of intent a few weeks ago, and if we hear about that, we'll be able to apply, and we won't know about that until what, Feb uh, we'll, we will apply in February of 2024, and we know later in 2024. And so our plan is, is to apply for those big uh, chunks of money to the, the build this fund, and as part of that uh, approach to having this mid EJ fund, we also uh, are trying to establish a foundation advisory council, so foundations have a lot more experience and you know, managing this amount of you know these, these uh, amounts, large amounts of money, but also to help uh, win our region for foundations to provide match. So doing some matching. So for example, if we have foundation partners who want to add money uh, to the to the pool for that particular state or their or their area of coverage. So just want to add to that. So I'm this one last question, and then I'm going to uh, close this out and trans so we can transition to the first block of sessions. Thank you for that, again, Dr. Hollis. That, Hello. Yes, sir. Name yeah. and organization? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Anthony David. Uh, I am a environmental justice board member for the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm a recent William M. LaPenta intern for NOAA. Uh, so my question is kind of, you know, looking at how do we uplift our young people and making sure that our young people have access to the, the money. You know, I hear that you're trying to, you know, incorporate more HBCUs within, you know, the hub model and trying to incorporate more institutions. But, you know, some of our colleges aren't necessarily passing that money down to interested students, especially when dealing with environmental justice issues. You know, some universities aren't really looking at environmental justice issues or even know what environmental justice is. So how do we make sure and ensure that we're uplifting our young people where they don't have to directly go through our universities? Because there's young people who are out there, me yep. included, who are doing the research, who are actively engaged with community members, but who aren't necessarily funded. So, you know, we have young people who are actually, you know, working with younger, even younger people. We have young people who are, you know, doing things outside of their pockets or doing things outside of their, you know, clubs or whatever you have it, but they aren't necessarily fully supported by their universities or even by other organizations. So, we, you know, the same issues that our bigger organizations are going through as far as grant writing and stuff like that, you know, us as young people, we don't have access to a lot of that. So how do we support our young people in this work? Yeah, I'll try to be. Thank you for that question. Um, we we will have uh, some young folks here uh, who are who are um, from SWIA. We have a young young member of the of the SWIA team, Asana here. We also have young people here from Central Del Pollo, familiar, right? Uh, who who will be who will hear who who will hear uh, who will be presenting. Uh, we also have young folks here from South Baltimore Community Land Trust. So South Baltimore Community Land Trust and and CEF are actually having a session on Saturday. It's a youth panel. The lunchtime says a youth panel, and they're going to talk about the work they've been doing in high schools, uh, mm -hmm. in both uh, Ben Franklin High School and some of the what the young people in Prince George's County. Uh, additionally, additionally, um, 
So let me just stop saying um and, and get focused with respond to your question. I think there's opportunities to engage with some of the infrastructure that we already have. So in the NWCP session, they talked about the youth councils, right? So you can join NWCP Youth Council. I think we have an internship program that we do every summer, our EJ Summer Scholars Program. That's an opportunity. We also have a Climate Justice Fellows Program that's for 18 plus. Those folks work with uh, communities and do a capstone project. This is our first time doing it. That's an opportunity. There, there are a number of EJ related uh, internship and fellowship programs that are out there. I know Dr. Barnes just received a new grant uh, from um, National Science Foundation. It's a Geo Adventures. I'm not getting it right, Dr. Barnes, but basically Geo Adventures, and that's an opportunity for uh, folks at HBCUs uh, to get engaged more in environmental issues. So I think at the undergraduate level, there are institutions that have programs for, for, for youth that are not in an undergraduate program or who are maybe unaffiliated with a club. I think one of the best things to do is connect to your local EJ group. So we have a lot of community-based organizations in this room. You said you're from Pennsylvania and you think about the tech technical work that we can do. I mean, for example, maybe Jerome can connect you to community-based org his organization or other CBOs in the Philadelphia area and other CBOs in the state of, the state of Pennsylvania. So I would say that would be the first place to look is connect to your local CBOs who are working on environmental, climate, and energy justice issues. Okay, thanks for that. And then we can you can chat with me later. So we're I'm look, we're looking to hire young people too. So let's let's let's, let's talk later. So thank you everybody. Uh, I want to go back to the other slides real quick and then get us transfers to the next set of sessions. Hold on a second. Uh, let me get out of this. Got a toggle. Okay, maybe I can. Oh. Okay, so what I want to do real quickly is cancel this. So, if you want to, if you want to get the agenda, if you haven't, if you don't have a printed copy of the agenda, uh, you can use this QR code. I didn't say that earlier, so I just want to give folks time to use this QR code. And you can download a uh, online version, um, downloadable version of the agenda. So I'll leave it there. So really excited for the day, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see y'all here. Uh, again, our theme this year is people, power, and politics. Um, after you download that QR code, please go ahead and uh, start transitioning out to your first uh, block of sessions. Uh, there'll be uh, hall monitors, traffic control folks to help you get to those sessions. Uh, most of the sessions are, are, are on the second floor. So thanks again, everybody in, in person. Thanks again, everybody online streaming out there. Really excited for the day and looking forward to having a great event today. Thanks. Take care.